John, I'm just wondering, Desmond Pendle here. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Listen, um, you, you spoke about a situation that exists. Uh, you didn't say so much about who brought about this situation. The persons, male and female. In other words, human beings must have created the situation you talk about. Could you just say a word on who you believe they were? Well, Desmond, I, I think, yes, there are human beings. The, the, the agents of this process are obviously human beings. Um, but I don't think, I think this, it's a mistake to actually try to identify and to, to, to dwell upon the identities of the individuals concerned. I mean, we can certainly speak about people who were and are very visible in this context. We know uh, these people. But I think far more important are the dynamics of, that brought this about. Um, uh, in our culture, in, in, in Ireland, I mean, this happened all in a very short time, in the last 50 years, uh, uh, maybe even much less. Um, I don't believe that it was, you know, I mean, I didn't talk about the, the difficulties in the church and the, the, the clerical abuse issue and so on, because I don't personally think that that was the trigger of anything, although that the propaganda has it that it was the factor. I think that was basically just a kind of created a pretext for people. There was another dimension of this in, in Ireland, which was that the church perhaps had become excessively, in my view, moralistic and had become excessively uh, pietistic and, and uh, having had a, a role forced upon it in the wake of the famine uh, to become essentially the moral police force was really a sitting duck for then the counter-revolution which happened in the 60s, which seeking to expunge all of the f former uh, belief systems out of what as, as at first was a kind of an adolescent rebellion in the world, which in Ireland became much more than that. And uh, young people and people not so young uh, began to see this as a way of uh, really uh, removing from the culture things that they found problematic, which seemed to impose upon them. I mean, they, and this really comes down to a certain idea of freedom, that they believe that uh, the freedom, in a definition of freedom, which was really the pursuit of the instinct, uh, without view of, without awareness of consequences, without a consciousness of consequences. And so, and I mean, if you actually uh, listen carefully to the discussion about all of these things, uh, there's very little talk about consequences. There's very little talk about actual real experience of freedom of that kind. People of my generation and, and somewhat older who were part of this revolution are not truthful in my experience about how they found freedom to be for them. And so we have, it goes on because the younger generations that are seduced by this idea that there is nothing more to it than that tradition, religion, these forces imposed a form of, of, of uh, control and oppression upon them uh, for reasons of social control, but also out of a kind of a misanthropic uh, uh, dislike of freedom, as understood by them. How this works then is that, you know, I think you don't actually need, as I say, a Politburo. I found that, you know, there are very... When you actually operate in the media, I've found, I mean, over the years, you know, you find that there's always something that's not quite clear, something that's not quite visible, but you're aware of it in yourself. And I became aware of it many, many times. A desire, and I identified it eventually as being related to my desire to be loved, my desire to be liked. So when you walk into a room full of people who have certain beliefs and share them, a group think, you become more and more reluctant to express a contrary view or a dissenting view. And so gradually everybody is inculcated in the same mindset. And this I think is how, generally speaking, media work. Uh, often wordlessly, often uh, without any necessity for words, often without any, uh, leaderlessly in fact in some ways. You don't need other words or leaders to, to push this agenda. But they do have leaders who emerge, we've had them in Irish society in the, in the last 50 years. Um, you know, Gary Fitzgerald, Mary Robinson, all of these people who, uh, Rory Quinn, these people who have uh, clung to Fat Rabbit, who clung to a certain view of what humanity could be, the perfectibility of humanity. All of these ideas which experience has shown to be completely hokum, but which 
because there is no discussion. The only voice of opposition has already been rendered uh, inadmissible by virtue of being obsolete. Um, this is the great problem. I mean, you, you uh, Desmond, would be aware I mean, of how the dynamics of debate, for example, on RTE work. That if you uh, want to express views like we're talking about, I'm talking about here, you would be invited onto panels, maybe. But only if you agree to conform to a particular role in the drama of the discussion, in which there will be other voices who will be uh, 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 the voices of correctness, of truth, of rightness. And you would be accorded the role of the token dissenter, the heretic, as you say. And the drama will then be to demonstrate the wrongness of your position and the defeat of your position as the discussion goes on. So there are many dynamics. I, often, I think it's very often it's, it's a mistake to think of the Politburo in a room planning the destruction or the disintegration or the dismantling of the culture in that way. Because very often, more and more, I find that it doesn't need to be others. I find it in myself. I mean, I find it extraordinary, even in the church. There's a great desire in the church now to conform, to be liked, to be loved by liberal society, to get a positive editorial in the Irish Times. Some bishops will do almost anything to, for that. <laughs> uh, do we have another question? Sorry, yeah. Um, John, I just wanted to ask the, uh, the very first question you said, uh, who created the world? What, was it God? Was your, is your God, uh, would you prefer people to say yes, no, or maybe? And also, is there a form the God takes that you, the, the God you're describing, does it have a form? And also, um, the last point about Richard Dawkins' book about God delusion, there's a repository, the science delusion by Rupert Sheldrake, which seems to tie in a lot with what you say. So just those two points about Basically, is it, would you prefer a more open-minded population who went, if somebody, the question was asked, did God create the world, we, we would all go, maybe. So we're actually open to rather than yes or no. Well, you see, words are just words. And God is beyond words, even the word God. So, uh, in it, but, but we are human, and so we must use words. But we must know, as we speak, that we use we use, at best, the least inadequate words to describe the indescribable and the ineffable. So, when we set a sentence down in print or in space, it acquires a certain permanence. But that permanence is illusory. We are all the time seeking to describe something that cannot be described, cannot be known, but must be known. This is the paradox of God. I don't agree with the, the point you made that, that I seem to be taking. The, I, I don't take the view, any view, against science. Science is vital. Science, the science that we knew, know grew out of Christianity. Science is the expression of a, a curiosity based on the idea that some divine being made the world according to principles which are discernible to the human mind. So this is an intensely Christian idea. Uh, to say that there is an opposition, therefore, between Christian, Christianity and science is a nonsense. There is no such opposition at all. Uh, but there is a necessity in culture, in human cultures, for specificity. We need to actually speak about rea real con concepts, real happenings, real people, real events. And we need to know the world through each other. Therefore, God inhabits us. So when we talk about God, we're not talking about a man sitting on a fluffy cloud or whatever. We're talking about a force which is mysterious, a, thing, a being who is, who is mysterious, who is unknowable, but who nevertheless defines something that is intensely knowable, which is reality and us. So in many ways, a lot of these discussions are actually counterproductive because they actually fix on that sentence that has captured itself in print or in space and try to take it apart in a positivistic exercise which can only end up in one way which is the complete disintegration of the words and the letters so that there's nothing but a pile of dust in the end. Um, 
My question is in connection with, you talk about um, uh, the conditioner and the conditioned. Um, like in schools, like you have the media and people listen to the radio and the TV, but when children go to school, isn't there already a system in place, an agenda, or well, should I say an agenda, but there's, um, children are, are not necessarily in a Catholic school, given the Catholic teaching. Parents don't seem to be aware of this, um, and children are being conditioned, unknown to their parents. One parent said to me, um, when her, her daughter had finished primary school, she was surprised her child didn't know about Easter. Her child thought Easter was all about Easter eggs. And, and I'm serious about that. And that's mild. Yeah. So conditioning has, is being done in schools and is being done in Catholic schools. Um, how do parents address that? When I'm aware of it, <laughs> but there are parents, like that parent that said to me, her daughter didn't know about Easter or anything to do with Easter. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree entirely. I mean, I, I, I think in many um, schools now, including many Catholic schools, the teaching of religion is really, religion is really taught as a kind of a history of superstition. It is taught as, a, presented as the views of other people in the past, uh, or your parents or your grandparents. It is as something which is an optional, you know, it's presented in that thought bubble, that, that third thought bubble between history and fact, to, at best, between history and fiction, at best. Um, and this fills our children with scepticism and unhope. And uh, there's nothing, it seems, you know, it seems to, nothing can be done to stop this because we are constantly being blackmailed and bullied as we were in the children's referendum recently. Um, with the idea that, you know, we must be tolerant. You know, I remember actually when my daughter was three, she was in, she'd grown up in England and, and uh, she, up to that age, and suddenly she came here and I hadn't made any plans to have her in school. So I actually started ringing around frantically looking for a school. And because a lot of the schools, my first preferences were full up or didn't have spaces, I, I found myself getting onto schools which are in the, what you might call the multi-denominational sector and seeing would, what would could I send her there for a few years and, and so I asked I started asking well what do you teach them you know by way of instruction in terms of faith and religion and so on they said well the message I was getting back was along the lines of well we teach them you know to have a deep tolerance of wide-ranging set of beliefs and so on and I said yeah that's great but um, what do you actually teach them and they, would, they wouldn't actually understand the question. I said, but no. Uh, and they just couldn't. And I said, look, I, I have this image of my daughter sitting in her desk, being intensely tolerant of everybody. <laughs> but what will she have that other people can tolerate? <laughs> Nothing. And this is the, the trick that we haven't cottoned on to. Because we actually, because this, this kind of dualism has happened up, we've lived in our bunker and we have our bunker logic and our bunker thought and our economics and our sociology and our politics and so on. And it, it, so it doesn't seem odd that religion has been objectified in this way and taught as a kind of a package which is there, which is removed from the subjectivity of the human being. But religion can only have any purpose if it informs and in, in, uh, vivifies the humanity of the subject the child, if it becomes a presentation of the truth, the total truth of reality. And that's, that's been removed. You know, religion is now being taught like history. Uh, and that's something that nobody's really talked about. And I mean, that's only a staging post along another, a much more dismaying route. You know, we know what the Minister of Education intends in that, to actually remove religion, to remove the absolute. I, I mean, I think we need to find new words uh, for all of this, because sometimes when we fall into certain words, like, as I said, like traditionalism, or you talk about the traditional values and family values and all that. Similarly, we talk about secularism, and that's a kind of a strange, amorphous subject that doesn't really speak to me as a person. I don't know what it is, really. It's lots of mix of different things and <coughs> political forces. I, I come up, I've come up with a clumsy word, which I think, for all its clumsiness, actually identifies the problem much more clearly. The problem is de-absolutization. 
that our children are being de-absolutized for the purposes of the bunker. That they're actually having the total infinite dimensions of themselves snipped off all around. So they can be let loose in the bunker and they will be good citizens. They will be you know, amenable to control. Um, we need to start having these discussions. And what do we do? How do we do? Well, we need to actually reclaim the instruments of public conversation. We need to actually remember that we live in a democracy up to now, for now. It's slowly being eroded in all kinds of ways. But we do need to reclaim it from the encroachment of this bunker mentality. And first, we, we need to identify, as the Pope said, that the bunker exists. We need to make the bunker visible, understand the dynamics of the bunker, what it is doing to us, what it is doing to our children. To know, of course, that there is another place that we can introduce our children to and remind them of and at, at every moment. that There is a, a mysterious great reality, an infinite reality, which is inhabited by the, the Creator who has made our lives possible. How can we talk? Could I talk like this on Maury in Ireland? No, I couldn't. But we need, I need to be able to. We need to reclaim Maury in Ireland so that I can speak like this there. One more. Thanks, John. Uh, you answered the question, basically, but anyway. Um, you gave us a great presentation all about how we live in this bunker, a man-centered bunker, right? And, but how do we poke holes in this bunker so we can get back to this wondrous vision that you talked about? of God, our creator, of what man should be, how can we come back to what God wants us to be like? It's a, it's a, it, no, you haven't, I haven't really covered that question, and it is a big, big question, because um, it's, a re, it's really about culture itself. Like, how do you speak back to a culture which is all one way, which has not alone presented reality in a certain way, but which has appropriated language, which has actually contaminated other language to make it uh, harmless? I mean, you just think about all words, like as soon as you announce yourself as somebody religious, as a person of faith, you immediately become redundant in a certain way. You have lost your power of argument because it is assumed that your arguments are entirely given to you by an ideological position. This is the, the you know. Now, I know there's another dimension, you know. Like myself and, and, and David are, are on Vincent Brown's show tonight. I often say this. If we went on tonight and, and Vincent Brown was to say to David, uh, <laughs> Uh, do you believe in God? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. And then he said, turned to me, he said, John, do, do, do you believe in God? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, come on, Vincent, give us a break. That's all old bunkum, isn't it? Mm. Immediately, I'm a thousand percent smarter than David. I mean, there's nothing he can say for the rest of the programme that will make him anyway smart compared to me. And I haven't said anything. I haven't actually had an argument. I haven't, all I've done is put a smirk on my face. Now, there's something seriously sick about a culture that it's possible to make an argument with a smirk. So we need to start constructing a culture in which it's not possible to make arguments with smirks. That you need words and concepts and ideas to answer back with, and reason and, and truth and fact. And we need to be fearless in stating these things. And we need to remember that story about Peter and the cocks. Because we, that's above all, that, was the th that is the thing that will save us. It's recognizing that we're in one of those moments and becoming determined to speak. No matter if it's a small place, it might be a dinner party, it might be the Late Late Show. It doesn't matter. We need to have the courage to speak. That's the only thing that will help to re start to reverse this. But remember, you know, this started with 12, 13 men in a room. It can happen again. 